Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this episode of the Horsemanship Journey Podcast. I'm Shane Jacob, your host. Today, we're joined with Derek Johnson. Derek is a U.S. Army veteran, a life coach, and trainer that's helped hundreds of clients and companies go from surviving to thriving through his coaching. Derek was awarded Soldier of the Year for his battalion three times. He's received numerous awards and took his leadership skills, certifications, and life experiences to help people take control of their mind and body so that they can thrive and not just survive. Sounds good to me. Derek, thank you so much for taking your time to be with us today. Thank you for having me, Shane. It's a pleasure being here. Right on. Well, for uh, people that haven't uh don't know you tell us about your story where it started your upbringing and how you got to be where you are for sure so yeah so as a child i grew up in germany my mother's german my father's african american so my father was a farmer out in mississippi his side of the family they have a ton of land and hard work ethic and discipline was in the bloodline and my mother's from germany she grew up in the city And so both parents, they were the oldest of multiple siblings, and they've been working since around the age of 13 or 14. So they've always been making money. They've always been working hard and providing for their brothers, sisters, and family. But because of their upbringing, they did see a lot of violence, drug addictions, and alcohol run on both sides of the family. And so with them being the oldest of multiple siblings, they had to grow up and mature really quickly. And so they went right into the work field. My dad was U.S. Army for 25 years, and my mother was a kindergarten teacher for Montessori school. And so most of their career, they were always the first ones there, the last ones to leave. But they were so mission driven with their careers that they did not really have time to truly work on themselves. So when I turned 11, that's when I noticed that there was a shift in the family dynamic where there was a lot more excessive drinking at home. And so only at night, between the hours of 9 p.m. to 1 a.m., there was a lot of rage and violence that would happen in the home. But I realized that it had nothing to do with me. I was the, vi- I was the verbal, physical, emotional punching bag. But I knew at the time, after six months of it first happening, I knew that this was not about me. Something is going on right now or in their past. So what initially got me into my personal development journey was dealing with those things as that kid and teenager. I was also getting bullied at school. And so I was that skinny kid. I was insecure. I had bad posture. I had a stuttering issue. I didn't really know who I was. And so at the age of 13, I made a decision. I said, from here on out, I'm no longer going to let people control me, whether it's family dealing with their toxicity, whether it's bullies at school. So my initial step one into personal development was fitness. I knew that I had to change my physicality, my physique, and my mentality. And once I fell in love with seeing the positive changes in my body, I got inspired to go deeper into my faith. And so from there, because I was getting physical and mental progress, I started having a lot more faith. Because before then, I was a kid wondering, why do bad things happen to good people? Why is this happening? And Nobody could genuinely answer my question. So I went on that self-discovery journey. And so by the age of 15, I became a certified personal trainer. And I started training my teachers, my parents, friends, my neighbors, my teammates on the sports teams that I was on. And I just fell in love with helping people get to that next level physically and with their health and overall nutrition. And so then segueing into college, I was also in the U.S. Army. And I was the U.S. Army Master Fitness Trainer. So essentially, I would get soldiers mission ready. So I took things that I learned from my past experiences, from education, and also in sports. And I was able to help soldiers get mission ready, essentially get them ready for deployment. But everything in retrospect was going back to that younger version. He had to learn his family patterns and dynamics and how to respond to it more efficiently, break the generational curses, and use what I was not giving to empower other people. (laughs) Nowadays, what I do is I help people break old patterns so they could thrive, not just survive, whether that's addictions, whether they crush it in sales, but they can't keep a relationship or marriage to save their life, whether they have a bad relationship with food, 
et cetera. So nowadays I help people break those old patterns so they can feel, feel like I have control of my life and they're not just crushing it over here and they tend to neglect the things that they don't really want to talk about. Yeah. Wow. That's an incredible story. You know what? There's so much in that. The, one of the things that I, I wanted to ask you about is early on, you said that you recognized, I, I can't remember if you said you were 11 or 13, but you recognized that what was happening was not, was not because of you. I think that's yeah. very fortunate because I think a lot of times that particular with kids, you know, you can think that what's happening is about you. I mean, how did you, were you able to make that distinction? I honestly got obsessed with learning people's comeback stories. I would read biographies and autobiographies. I would watch a lot of interviews and movies and I could correlate their story to my story. And I would always see that, huh, she's good at this or he's good at that because of their upbringing. And so learning all these different stories and also working on my faith, I would tell myself, this is part of my comeback story. This is part of my comeback story. And I would say that every day out loud and in my head. And because I just saw myself, I would play this analogy that I was like, I am the superhero in the dark dungeon <laughs> getting my ass handed to me and everything was happening, but I'm going to come out of this and help empower other people. So I always have to have these analogies that help guide me through it. And also I would zoom out and say, you know what? I have both parents. We've traveled to multiple countries. We have a beautiful home in Florida. We have four bedrooms, four baths, a screened in pool. I always have food and air conditioner. I was like, the violence does not overshadow everything else. So I, I was that kid that never complained because I had friends that grew up in foster care. They didn't have a home and they didn't know who their parents were. So I never wanted to complain and I would always be grateful for what I did have. And I said, you know what? I'm not going to bash someone's reputation. I'm going to keep it to myself, but actually do the inner work. So the number one thing that definitely helped was learning other people's stories and I could relate to them and I would just get excited and say, wow. No wonder he's good at that. He went through a lot of hell or some dark times. So knowing proof of people that I knew or people that I looked up to just got me excited about life. So anytime things would happen, I would say, yes, this right here sucks, but I know this is part of my comeback story. What can I do to flip this energy and harness that? That is incredible. That is really something that, <clears throat> that, uh, that you knew the power and was able to accept the influence and, and just went out and you said that you, you know, studied all these the, the people, however, you, you know, saw the people and then, and then, but then <clears throat> you had to have, I mean, something inside you gave you, you had to, to have that faith. I mean, you had to have faith that if you're constantly telling yourself that this is going to be my comeback story, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. That took faith to be able to visualize your future. I mean, you yes. can touch on that a little. Yes, for sure. I've always believed that everybody who has trauma or pain, we're all given a gift. We all have a gift in our trauma and pain. And I truly feel that my gift as a child was discernment. So being that quiet kid sitting in the corner, just seeing your parents screaming and just them attacking you and all that. And the very next morning, hey, where would you like to go have breakfast or lunch today? As if nothing happened for three hours last night. And it would happen so much that I got, I got good at reading their patterns, their reactions, why I reacted a certain way. And then I could just start reading my family and like their friends. And like I would drive them before I had a license or anything to the party. And I was their DD. And I would just sit there quiet and just people watch. And I was like, this is like a reality show. This is interesting. And so I went deep into psychology, just analyzing who was around me. And I learned so much. So in college, when I was studying psychology and learning patterns and everything, I had all these aha moments when I say, wow, I was doing that at 15 shadow work, or I was analyzing my family at 17. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I was just guided to do these things. And so definitely the gift in the pain. So I always challenge people to say, you know what? You did go through dark times. You do have trauma depression is real. All these things do exist, but what is the silver lining? What is the light in the darkness? And discernment was definitely mine. Being able to read people's energy, meet them where they're at and build them up. So that right there connected directly to my faith. But when I was younger, I didn't have faith. I was the kid that was just like, 
why do bad things happen to good people? Why this? Why that? I would ask questions in church and people would just say, oh, you know, but nobody would give me a definite answer. And at first it was frustrating, but then I got inspired to say, you know what? I think this is going to have to be a one-on-one -on -one relationship between God and I, because I'm not generally getting a direct answer from people. They're just telling me to, oh, look over here, or they brush it off. Or I was that teen that would just annoy people because I asked too many questions. I was a kid that always asked, why? Why is this? Why is that? And after a while, people were like, Derek, why do you have so many questions? I'm like, I'm, I'm genuinely curious. And I would give them perspectives that I could see that they never thought of. <laughs> and then I said, all right, they're not giving me answers, so I have to go down my path. So definitely accepting that the gift was discernment, but how can I use this to empower others? Because I saw some people in my family, they also had gifts, but they use it in a narcissistic, destructive path rather than positive, empowering. What did you, uh, what did you realize when, when, you, when, when, people, when you were seeking that answer and you didn't feel like people were giving you a straight up answer, what did you come to realize was the straight up answer? The straight up answer, which I usually found after a hard workout at night when my parents were asleep or they'd pass out drunk, I would work out to chase that calmness. So during that mental calmness, that's when I would just have no self-judgment, no emotions. I was just still. And then I had a deep connection with God at that time. And what it was, was that you were on the right path and what you didn't get from them, you would give others. So what I mean by that is our family ran like a business and ran like a, a military platoon. It was just like, all right, we got to get stuff done. F your feelings. We got to get stuff done. We got to lead by example. We got to go wake up early, work out. Everything did help in that regard, but we didn't say I love you. We didn't hug each other. I don't, I don't really have memories of getting kissed on the forehead or little things like that as a child. And so with the support and the love and affection that was in there, and I realized that my faith in God was just, was just saying that what you weren't receiving, you will eventually give. And I didn't know, I didn't understand how or why or why I was feeling that. But the older I got, I realized that people would just come up to me and just open up. At first, it was overwhelming. I was like, why is this lady just tell me everything? I was like, I'm sitting at this table in public or I'm just shopping. And it's like, hey, boom. And I was like, okay, the floodgates are opening. But then I realized it was like something is happening here. I think it's because I'm calm and they just are comfortable to tell me their things and I don't know who they are. And then it clicked. And I said, wow, God, this is what you have me for. I don't know what I'm going to do with this yet, but I feel like there's something here. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, Derek. What, why is it? Why do you think that we struggle so much mentally? I think nowadays the biggest reason is people don't have control of their attention. They're distracted by the social media. They're distracted by the notifications going off on their phone. They're distracted by government, trending topics, sports. Just they're distracted by everything. So they have a lot of unfinished projects. They start one thing, the phone lights up. Oh, who's this? Hey, Jimmy. Yeah, yeah, I got to do this. They stop what they're doing. They stop the next thing. And so many people, they feel like they have endless unfinished projects, backyard projects, internal projects, faith their body, their finances, career, relationships. And they just feel like I need to get the edge off. I need to get the edge off, which then leads to vices. So nowadays is definitely people don't have control of their attention because everybody and everything wants your attention. Politicians, celebrities, your family, kids, your dog, your neighbor. And the person's like, can I get 10 minutes of myself? Like, <laughs> I'm doing everything for everyone. So definitely I've noticed is attention span because people's energy and attention and focus is everywhere except for getting one thing completed and then going on to the next. Is, is that what you say? Because, yeah, I mean, there is so many demands and there's so much competition. And I mean, it is fierce competition for our attention. I mean, how, you yes. know, how do we <clears throat> how do we even handle that? Right. I mean. How do you manage that? Great question. So the first thing that I walk people through is an elimination process. So they grab a sheet of paper and pen, and we ask ourselves the question, what can I get rid of that will help me make more progress? What could I get rid of and eliminate that'll help me make more progress? So we start with that. 
So instead of adding to the routine, instead of changing everything, we first start with what we eat. Maybe he eats too many processed carbs. Maybe she eats too much sugar. Okay, what about with what they drink? Maybe he says, you know what? I want to start cutting back on the beer drinking. Or she says, you know what? I want to cut back on the caffeine or whatever else they drink. So we start with what they eat and drink. They start to get some clarity. They write those out. Then we go deeper and I just ask them, what else? You know what? Intrusive thoughts. Procrastination. Self-doubt. I don't even know where that comes from. And they really start opening up and they start flowing and they're writing it out. And I just keep asking, what else? What else? What else? And after a while, they have a list of things that we can focus on. But most importantly, they have clarity. They're not judging themselves, but they know where they're at. And they say, if I get rid of these things or replace it with something healthier or better, I can start to have some level of control. And because of that, in that moment, they're in a flow state thinking and they're not worried about anything else. And they're actually just thinking about themselves for a moment. And so then we formulate a plan on how to get rid of those things and to make progress in their life. But the whole intent is to remind them that the power that you're already looking for is within you. We just first have to get rid of some things, get some control from the outside and our environment. And then once we actually give focus and attention to our goals, family, whatever we're working on, skill sets, we're way more present because we're already clear on what we need to get rid of. So that person's like, you know what? He hasn't smoked a pack of cigarettes in five days. For him, that's a lot. He's been smoking for 10 years. And so he feels excited. His confidence is up. His energy is up. He's like, man, I kicked it. It's been five days. She's finally worked out five days for the first time in months or years. He stopped getting on a certain dating app, whatever that person's individual thing is, but they're excited because they're stacking small wins, building momentum. So then in that moment, they feel that, hey, you know what? I can do deep work on this skill set or whatever I'm doing. Because usually they've pissed themselves off in the morning because he grabbed co coffee instead of water. Now his heart rate's up. He's still tired. And now he has anxiety because he's dehydrated. And then he can't focus at work. And now everybody needs him. And it just compounds. And he's just like, oh, my God, I can't wait to get home and just drink. Like, I'm just overwhelmed. So step one, process of elimination. What can we get rid of so we can make more progress? And then once we start with that, once we focus on whatever's the task <laughs> at hand, we start getting more present because we're already feel more confident within ourselves. We're excited five days into the workout, five days into whatever they're doing. And then they realize that, you know what? I'm, I'm in control, not society, not my past, not an ex, not whoever or whatever. So that's the way that I like to approach it is process of elimination, build them some power and confidence that they created. And then they, they're more present in that particular thing that they're focused on. Right on. So, so yeah, that, it sounds like, like the prioritization, I think that, you know, when, when we look at the activities that we're doing, when we, if we're going to take the time to do it, it's pretty easy to say, Hey, these are clearly not helpful or not serving me. Right. But, but yeah. it seems like in addition to that, I mean, do you find that we, that, but that there are good activities that we could be doing also, but they're not the best. That some yes. of those good ones have to have to go. Do you, do you find that? Yes, definitely. So an example right now, I call it motivational porn. Motivational porn basically just means some guys, they'll go and watch five David Goggins videos or watch 30 minutes of Tony Robbins. And they do it all day long. Memes and memes and quotes and all this and reading Zig Ziglar and all this information is amazing. But it's like a dopamine hit now. They feel high, but the guy hasn't even like worked out in two months. But every day he absorbs his motivational content and it just feels good. And I'm like, all right, you haven't made money. You haven't lost weight. Like what, what's going on? We can't just keep absorbing. So with that, that's one example that is very common now is some people, they stack their morning routine. So I got to do breath work. I got to work out. Now I got to take an ice bath because if I don't, my buddy's going to be like, you didn't get in the ice bath today or Joe Rogan's in their head or whoever. Like there's all this stuff that is out there. It does work. It's, it's all effective, but we don't need a 10 step process morning routine. So I've noticed nowadays it's very common for people to feel like they have to stack their morning routine with all these steps to feel successful. The dopamine hit did hit, but what do they do with the rest of their day? The rest of their day is usually not productive, but they chase that morning high. So going back to your question, what they're doing are positive things, but 
There's no need to do five or more things in the morning. So I just challenge people to keep it simple. With the morning routine, just choose two, one for the body and one for the mind. So if we move the body first, the mind opens. So whatever they do, mental, prayer, visualization, journaling, meditation, it's going to be way more effective. And then it's like, hey, the rest of your day, focus on what's going to move the needle in your life or business forward. Instead of them doing all these modalities, thinking they got to buy all these kits and listening to all these people, where it's just like, wait a minute, don't overwhelm yourself. Go back to the basics and just keep it simple. That's great advice. Right on. Derek, I want to ask you, your, uh, your website and your media is just full of people that have had transformations, uh, a lot of change in bodies and a lot of change in attitudes. Um, tell, us, tell us more about this physical, uh, the, the physical change and what, how that affects our mental and just get us in more into what it is you yeah, do. For sure. So I focus on the mind-body connection. So I started off just being the performance and health guy. So helping soldiers, helping civilians. But the older I got, I realized that some people tend to go backwards, meaning back to old bad habits. And the reason why they didn't overcome something from their past. So I would see clients I worked with months or years ago, and they would lose the results. I see them in person or on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, no, he picked up the bottle again, or he's back with his ex-wife. And the cycle continues. And I just see all these things. But I took it personal and I said, you know what? I need to take responsibility. I need to learn more about psychology so I can get deeper into life coaching. So then we can break that pattern where they less likely or if ever go backwards because they're not just chasing old patterns and feeling stuck. So I approach it with the mind body opposed to just one area. So that way people, they have control and they're not just in shape, but struggling over here or they're not only doing the inner work but they're physically out of shape or unhealthy. So I focus on the mind and body. So that person has total control from the inside out and they have those aha moments. That's why I grab that at night after a stressful day. That's why I have this gut reaction when family knows what to say to offend me or piss me off. So <clears throat> we, we go deeper into it. So essentially just breaking those patterns so they can truly start to feel like they're thriving and not just barely getting by or, Hey, on paper, I'm successful, but over here, they're neglecting everything else. So we focus on everything to remind them that, hey, you can do everything. You can be the anomaly. Because too many times it's, it's said that, oh, if, if you want success, you won't have a good relationship. Or if you want a good relationship, you can't have the money. And like, no, you can have it all. Like, you can be that person in your family that's just like, hey, we're a walking billboard for what we do. Nobody's perfect, but reminding people, think bigger, dream bigger. Their goals, dreams, and aspirations used to be up here, but they started to dwindle because they listened to too many people's opinions that are usually fear-based. So I just want to remind people to say, hey, your goal used to be bigger, business, personal, career, whatever it is, think bigger again. Like life is short. Let's make it amazing. Right on. Right on. Very good. Derek, um, it's been said, it might have been Stephen Covey that said, you know, that the, the best <clears throat> the quickest way to boost our self-confidence and improve how we feel about ourselves is to make it is to positively improve how we see ourselves to change our physical body. And so, you know, uh, I think probably at times we've all made improvements and seen that and have the motivation. But but then I guess what you're saying is if there's an underlying thing, that's what stops us from either maintaining or continuing to move forward in that way because i know that there's periods of time i was uh i was qu quite a lot overweight and uh i mean it was like kind of getting on a high when i started to, i i lost so much weight at one point people thought i was dying you know they're coming up to me like hey partner you know you know is the chemo okay you know i just i yeah. took it a little <laughs> bit too far but 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 what i'm saying is is if it was so easy why you know we wouldn't be overweight and out of shape and everybody would just kind of be going for it. So, I mean, what is exactly. it the mind that blocks us? I mean, what's stopping us from maintaining or, or moving forward? Great question. So usually what it is, is they have an underlying pattern that they're not aware of yet. Because the older we get, we tend to push those things back, especially as men. I've seen it firsthand in the military. Guys are in great physical condition mentally strong, discipline, 
But if you look at their personal life, it's completely different, but they just keep pushing it. They're like, no, 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 I'm an alpha male. I'm this, we, we don't talk about feelings here, but that stuff will start to fester and build whatever they're ignoring. And so it's very common for either people to push it under the rug or into the closet or to mask said emotion with food, alcohol, more, more success, more money, more material things, more whatever it is to overshadow. Like, hey, I'm doing this. So I, I'm, I'm overpowering with my positivity. But knowing deep down, it's like when they're laying in bed, looking at the wall, they're thinking about that thing that they truly want to work on or overcome. So more so facing yourselves giving yourself more grace and really treating yourself like your best friend and saying, you know what? I am deficient in this, or this does have control over me. It's okay to ask for help, whether that's with the professional, whether that's just family, whether it's at church, but just being honest with ourselves and saying, you know what? Let me stop <laughs> overshadowing this. Let me sit in set of motion. So I challenge some people sometimes to say, Hey, when was the last time that you just had a good cry? for like one minute. Nothing sad is happening, but you just have to release. You're just like, I worked out, I closed a business deal, I did this, but I still feel just on edge. What is going on? I'm like, hey, instead of picking up the bottle tonight or binge eating or watching three episodes of whatever show, just sit for a moment. Maybe you have to yell for a moment. Maybe you got to go in your car, grab the steering wheel and just go and just release or just cry for a minute. And I ask people that and they're like, huh, it's been a long time. And I'm just like, I'm not telling you to schedule it, but whenever you feel it, just allow yourself to release for a moment and you might feel refreshed. You might have some clarity and there's nothing wrong with that because sometimes people will mask emotions. Sometimes they'll mask something else or they'll try to over, override things with more positive. They give, give, give to everybody else. Just like, hey, we see what you're doing. You're a great leader, but you're going to burn out if you keep going at this. You got to have some you time. Like it's okay to put yourself first. <clears throat> so definitely is that challenging the individual to be honest with themselves because most people they know exactly that thing they truly want to get rid of or work on and so a lot of the times they carry those things into relationships so an example if somebody was obese as a kid it was overweight and they got bullied if they do public speaking in their career in their head they probably still feel like that 12 year old fat kid in front of the class getting laughed at and they keep stuttering doing the presentation, even though they, they're amazing at what they do. Their KPIs in business are great. But for that split second, they're like, oh, they're going to laugh at me. And they feel like that 12-year-old who's made fun of in class. And so that can hold a lot of people back from the next level of success because they have a fear of more responsibility, which is actually the fear of getting laughed at because I don't deserve this. Or sometimes it could come from bullying. Sometimes it's from a negative parent, an ex, whoever, whatever. But if they can just be honest with themselves and say, you know what? That's where it started. I hold anger towards this kind of person or towards that family member or towards public speaking because there's something in the past that happened. I just didn't like that feeling. So I just challenge people to face it, sit in it, really walk yourself through the scenario, whatever it was, and just say, all right, that is the moment where things shifted. And we're not being angry about it. We're not being sad about it. Just it is it's easier said than done, but sitting and being neutral with it. And most importantly, looking at the big picture to say, will I allow said person to dictate my future, my relationships, co-working spaces, success, whatever that is, because too many times people carry that stuff with them and it truly can hold them back. Right on, right here with you. Uh, I love what you said. Um, I love your message. And I love what you said. Give ourselves some grace. You know, uh, that's, uh, that's a big, powerful part of it right there. Um, oh, yeah. You can, uh, you know, I think in hearing your story that, the, that that kid where everything wasn't perfect, what you saw seems to be what you became. and. Uh, and you can feel the, uh, you can feel the the message and the and the power and the help that you give to people. Derek, what would you like to leave us with today on the horsemanship journey? Great question. I would say to ask yourself, what do I have to do to become the man or woman that I always needed? What do I have to do to become the man or woman that I always needed? Maybe your father wasn't in your life. Maybe your mother wasn't. Maybe they were, but you want to be better than them to provide for your family. But what do you need to do to become the man or the woman that you always needed? 
And once you figure that out, how can you give that version of yourself to the world, whether that's society, family, communities, but I truly believe we're all here to pinpoint what that thing is. Yes, this happened. How can I flip it? Because when people see your walking proof of what you, be what you can become after pain, then you can teach others. But everything will come full circle. Your inner child's excited. He's proud of you. She's proud of you. And you're just like, wow, it all made sense. And I truly believe this. The reason we're all here, <laughs> we go through things and we can help empower and build up others. So what do you have to do to become the man or woman that you always needed? Right on. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate you. Derek, where can uh, people find out about you, more about you and what you offer? People can find me on social media at fit with Derek two. That's the number two, or they could just search Derek Johnson, same profile picture and everything. And my intent with social media is just to plant seeds. If an individual hits the snooze button too many times every morning and they cause their own stress and anxiety, they might see a video that talks about that and they're like, yeah, he's talking to me. I need to stop hitting the snooze button every day. So that's my whole, that's my whole intent is to plant seeds to show people to, Hey, stop wasting potential. Life is short. Let's make it amazing. Stop being stuck in the past. Let's, let's get excited again. Right on. Let's make it amazing. Derek, thank you so much again for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, Derek Johnson. Thank you for having me, Shane.